<laughs> you live, therefore you must die! <laughs> Look, an A-bomb! Oh, I haven't seen one of those in a while. Oh, man. Oh, but seriously, another forest fire? Well, these are my last precious moments of life. I'm gonna take you all with me. That includes you, and you, and you. What is that? No, 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 no! <laughs> oh, my phone! No! Yuck. <sighs> How did it come to this? Why did that man have to get blowed up with his phone? To answer that question, we have to go way back in time. To the year 1976. It's now the year 1976. NASA has just unveiled the first space shuttle Enterprise. Um, the other Enterprise. Apple Computers has sprung into existence with Steve Jobs and Steve Woz in the well, Steve W. And most importantly, the $2 American bill has entered circulation. Enter John Aristotle Phillips, better known as JP to his friends. John has just arrived to Princeton University and is totally unaware of the mill that fate was preparing for him. A mill that would include politics, Hollywood, entrepreneurship, national security, abduction, Oh, and what was that other one? Oh, yes. Constructing plans to build an atomic bomb. John's life up to this point had been fairly normal. Born in North Haven in 1955 to Greek immigrant parents, John was raised and grew up like any other child. Despite scoring average on his IQ test, John always did well in school when he felt like it. In 1973, he graduated from high school, where he then spent two years at Berkeley. Then shortly thereafter, he transferred to Princeton. So let us continue. John's obsession with building an atomic bomb begins while taking a course called Arms Control and Disarm... Arm... Oh, wow. Disarmament. Disarmament. Armament. Oh, my God. Disarmament. Wow, that's a tough one. Arms control and disarmament. I never took that course. Is that, do they still offer that? His professor mentions that it would only take 15 pounds of plutonium to assemble a crude atomic bomb. This was to illustrate the point that if a terrorist was to steal that small amount, they could potentially assemble their own weapon. But most of the students seem to agree that it would be close to impossible for someone to get their hands on plutonium, let alone know how to actually build a bomb with it. John, however, wasn't quite so sure. As the days ticked on, John found himself unable to stop thinking about what his professor and the other students had said. How hard could it really be? With the exception of plutonium-239, everything else could probably be easily acquired from the local hardware store and a chemical supply house. Suddenly, it strikes John. He had two months to come up with and complete his junior independent project. And for his project, John was going to design a fully functional atomic bomb. John is openly dissuaded of this idea from friends, professors, and even his own project advisor, Freeman Dyson. And I wish my name was Freeman. Such an awesome name. The general opinion seemed to be that it would be ridiculous to try such a thing, and John would probably just fail. But this skepticism would not dissuade him. John knew that if he could assemble a functional atomic bomb, that anyone else could do the same thing, and drastic measures would need to be put in place to keep humanity safe. John's dedication is such that while his friends head south to party for spring break, John spends his time in D.C. at the Atomic Energy Commission building to dig through declassified records of the Los Alamos project. He was shocked at the amount of information that he felt should have been classified that he was able to obtain for just $25. John is now sure he will be able to complete his design. Once finished, his goal is to have a 125-pound bomb 
roughly the size of a beach ball that can easily fit into the trunk of a car. By his calculations, it would yield a 9.5 kiloton explosion. For comparison, the bomb dropped on Hiroshima was 13 kilotons. This would be enough to wipe out a quarter of Manhattan, a terrifying prospect for a homemade bomb built by one man using everyday supplies. John makes quick progress. However, he soon hits his first major hurdle, which explosive material to use for the plutonium, and how exactly to arrange these explosives around the plutonium for the implosion. In a nutshell, in order to achieve the desired reaction, the plutonium core needs to be surrounded by a certain type of high explosive. These explosives in turn need to be arrayed just right around the plutonium core in a certain way. Then when the firing is in place and the detonation of the explosive charges will then explode inward with such force that the previous subcritical mass of the plutonium is now supercritical and kaboom! John's implosion problem was also a major hurdle for the first scientist who developed the atomic bomb. This was such a massive part of being able to detonate an atomic bomb that it was a highly classified state secret. In fact, a couple by the name of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were executed in 1953 for allegedly passing the secret to the Russians. Dang. John becomes so obsessed he deprives himself of sleep, a social life, and misses all his classes in order to dedicate 100% of his time to his work. He finds himself on academic probation, and if he doesn't pull a perfect A from his project, he can kiss Princeton goodbye. After countless sleepless nights and constant work, John finds himself with only 17 hours left before the deadline. At this point, he is trying everything he can think of to overcome the implosion problem. He finally gets a radical idea. There was a corporation by the name of DuPont, you may have heard of them, that worked closely with the US military in providing them with materials that they use for their atomic bombs. Maybe he could just give them a call and they might accidentally give him what he needs to know. With nothing to lose, John called the DuPont Corporation. When he was finally able to get the right man on the phone, he told him he was a student, and using scientific jargon, described to him what he was trying to do. And John couldn't believe he was even trying this. But to his total and complete shock, the man on the other side of the phone said, We do some of the chemical work for the US Army Nuclear Division. We sell them to do the job in their atomic bombs, which have a similar density problem to the one you're talking about. And just like that, John's final hurdle had been resolved. Stunned that he was able to get such information so easily, he feverishly went back to work. <clears throat> I said he feverishly went back to work. Oh, come on. Come here. No, come Okay, that's it. Oh, come on! His final paper is 34 pages long and is titled an assessment of the problems and possibilities confronting a terrorist group or non-nuclear nation attempting to design a crude plutonium fission bomb. The next day, John turns in his paper, and he waits. A week later, in high spirits, John returns to the physics department to get his paper and grade. He digs through all the papers looking for his. But it's not there. John is filled with dread. He thought his paper was so bad that his advisor, Freeman Dyson, removed it from the pile to help conceal the embarrassment of a total failure. At this point, John gives up on all hope of his design and Princeton. Eventually, John returns yet again to claim his paper and to get closure. However, when he arrives back at the office, he finds out that his paper has been confiscated. And you can probably imagine why. Despite different opinions on the matter, John's A-bomb design is a success. And by success, I mean it scared the crap out of his professors and government officials. The FBI takes his paper and all his other work and marks it as classified. Even though John has not used any classified information for his design, the government could still restrict his research because of something called the Born Secret Doctrine of the Atomic Energy Act. In essence, the Born Secret is a permanent gag order to stop all public discussion of a certain topic, in this case, atomic weapons. 
Besides becoming recently acquainted with the FBI, John also suddenly finds himself buried in fame. His phone won't stop ringing and reporters won't stop following him around. He now finds himself constantly giving interviews from major publications, news stations, and more. The one question that John gets over and over again is, Where do you keep your bum? Most people seem to think he actually had built the thing and it was just under his bed somewhere. John even ends up on a game show called To Tell the Truth. All this public attention has has one dreaded side effect. He has now caught the eye of those who want to build their own atomic weapons. Many suspicious people, some acting as journalists, approach John and try to get a copy of his paper. John was even approached by the ambassador of the Pakistan embassy trying to get his designs. The French were on the verge of selling the secrets and the means to make atomic energy to Pakistan. India had recently acquired the bomb and Pakistan was desperate to follow suit. Pakistan was trying to buy plutonium and other materials, saying it was only for the purpose of energy and not for weapons. But if that was the case, then why was Pakistan so interested in getting John's work, John wondered. The FBI soon comes knocking on John's door yet again. The United States was completely opposed to the French-Pakistan deal and knew that John's recent interactions with the ambassador of Pakistan would help build a case to get the French to cancel the deal. John, with the help of the FBI, played along with the ambassador of Pakistan for a while until they had enough damning evidence that was then brought to the Senate floor. The French backed out of the deal. As all of this is happening, John is approached by Hollywood, who want the rights to his story to make a movie. John wants the lead role in the movie, but Hollywood doesn't want to wager a million dollar film on someone who has never acted before. The film unfortunately never gets off the ground, but it isn't totally bagged either. To this day, you can see the project listed on IMDb. After graduating, John didn't slow down. He ran for Congress in 1980 and 1982 and actually won the primary. This was also the first time a candidate used computers to help gather data for their campaign. John ended up losing the general election twice in a row, but these experiences gained him valuable information. John, along with his brother Dean, used their political knowledge and started a successful company that provided technology to political campaigns and organizations. They named the company Aristotle. So what is John doing today? John still runs Aristotle with his brother Dean. Along with Aristotle and other businesses, John and Dean also started a new political odds website called Predicted that has seen massive success. John and Dean recently found themselves in a terrifying situation while traveling abroad for political matters. Back in 2017, John and Dean were in Kenya during a very tense and unstable election. They were approached by a handful of armed men who said they were with the police. They were handcuffed, dragged, and forced into the trunk of a car. To make matters worse, a few days before this, a key election figure had been tortured and murdered by similar men. To their great relief, they were eventually taken to the airport and locked in a cell along with another one of their work associates by the name of Andreas. All three of them had been detained without cause or reason, and eventually they all made it back to the United States. To say that John Phillips has led an interesting life would be a total understatement. Thanks to his work back in Princeton, nuclear hardware and technology are much more safeguarded to help prevent them from falling into the wrong hands. So next time you're walking outside and enjoying a nice day of not being blown up by a nuclear device, take a moment to thank John Aristotle Phillips better known as the A-Bomb Kid.